Hi everyone, hello, I'm Susan Cole. And I'm Vanessa Rapier. And welcome to Health Empower, the live broadcast series on health inequalities affecting people of colour and crucially, things that we can do to address it. Thank you, Susan. And today we have some wonderful guests. Um, I'm really excited to introduce and know them well um, and have worked with them closely. So it's a complete pleasure. So first of all, we have Dr. Shima Tarek. And Shima is a HIV and sexual health consultant at Mortimer Market Centre in London, where she actually set up and leads a specialist HIV and menopause service and is also a senior research fellow at UCL's Institute for Global Health. Shima's research focuses on the health and well-being of women living with HIV and across the life course. She's the chief investigator of the PRIME study, which explored menopause in among 869 women living with HIV in England and has co-authored UK and EX guidelines on management of menopause in women living with HIV. So, so excited that Shima will be with us. And then we have Dennis Onyango, who is the Director of Programs at the Africa Advocacy Foundation and he oversees initiatives supporting migrants at risk or living with HIV, hepatitis, mental health, TB and other health conditions, as well as those who are experiencing violence, sexual exploitation, trafficking and other harmful cultural practices. Dennis has over 20 years experience with um, grass, uh, grassroots community health promotion and in supporting patients living with HIV. He's involved in health policy work at national and international levels and has served on several advisory boards and policy groups. So you can see, um, Susan, we're going to have a fantastic time as ever. Absolutely. I mean, I'm so excited to, to have them both on. I was actually with them both last week in Sweden. I'm very jealous. Yeah, well, you're very jealous <laughs> at the uh, AIDS um, Im Impact Conference. I actually spoke on a panel um, uh, with Shima about um, menopause and, and women living with HIV. And I know Dennis was speaking as well. But I mean, one thing that re really struck me at the conference is despite the tremendous progress that we've made in HIV, the fact that people on effective treatment can't pass it on to their sexual partners, that women with HIV can have children born free of HIV. The reality is for many people, particularly from, from black communities, aren't benefiting to the same extent. And, and very often intersecting forms of stigma, discrimination and disadvantage is it affecting people um, from these communities? And, and certainly stigma continues to be a, a massive issue. Definitely, Susan. I think that it's, you know, any time that we have a conversation about how far that we've come within HIV, and we've, as you said, we have come tremendously far, unfortunately, it's always marred with stigma and that ongoing stigma. And um, it's one of the reasons why um, on the 21st of July um, is Zero HIV Stigma Day. And this is a joint initiative um, of NAS and IAPAC. Um, and that's in collaboration with the Fast Track Cities Institute and the Global HIV Collaborative. And it's with a number of um, partners across the sector that is really just to galvanize a movement to say to, people, communities, companies, countries, just to help raise awareness about HIV stigma, but also um, ways to learn to um, help stop it as well, because we all have a part to play in challenging um, stigma. Um, and I, just to put a shout out, because Mabele, who was the first black Africa, black South African woman to publicly share her HIV status. So really shattering um, the stigma that I'm sure she experienced um, in her life. Fantastic. I'm really looking forward to that day. But shall we bring on Shima now? Exciting. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Shima. Hello. Wonderful to see you in, in the UK, not in the <laughs> 
<laughs> I, know, I, I loved how you dropped that in and I just need to make it clear to all your viewers that I hardly ever go anywhere this is like the first time I'm not often like swanning off this season and hanging out with Susan it's like the first time in about three years but it was lovely <laughs> yeah, fantastic now, now Shima I talk about the, um, the prime study um, that mm. you've led on as the piece of research that just keeps on giving and for me, one of the most important bits of research that you uncovered was the disparities between um, um, women of colour uh, going through the menopause. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what you actually found there? Yeah, so um, I, the main aim of our study wasn't really to look at differences according to ethnicity, um, but it was a question that naturally emerged. Um, mm. And actually, it was one of my colleagues, one of Vanessa's colleagues, Rageshri Dariwan, who has probably featured on this podcast. <laughs> um, coming on soon. He's coming on soon. <laughs> and uh, so she suggested that we look at women um, in terms of ethnicity. So we did a sort of deeper dive into the ethnicity mm. data. So... Uh, what we found was that 70% of participants were of black African ethnicity, which is what you would expect because this is women living with HIV in the UK. So that just reflects who we know is living with HIV in the UK. Um, and we found some really, I want to say so, they are sobering, but they're unsurprising to those of us who are of colour. So um, we found that women who were, so these are all women living with HIV aged between 45 and 60, so midlife women. We found that black African and black Caribbean women were more likely to be more highly educated than white British women in the prime study, but they were less likely to be employed and they were more likely to be living in poverty. So despite having higher levels of education, that wasn't translating to a better sort of better financial security. And that will not come as a surprise to any of us mm -hmm. sitting here. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing that we found was that women uh, living with HIV of Black Caribbean and Black African ethnicities were more likely to report psychological distress. However, mm -hmm they were less likely than white British women to be on antidepressant medication. Now, we don't know what the reason is. Now, it could be partly that women from Black African, Black, Car uh, Black Caribbean communities were less likely to take up antidepressant. And I'm sure that is part of it. But the other thing that we know in the general population is that people who are from racially minoritized communities, especially people from the black community, are less likely to be able to access mental health care. So I am sure that's the sort of more likely sort of driver of this. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's really we didn't specifically look at access to menopause care yeah. um, by ethnicity, although that's something we probably should look at. We didn't find any association with ethnicity and any different symptoms, but that could be because the majority of women in our sample were black African. Mm. So we didn't have yeah. large numbers of white British women, but there's loads of data from elsewhere about ethnicity and menopause. Mm. Thanks so much, Shima, because I think that um, you also just picked on something really relevant about um, those that were experiencing um, mental health difficulties but weren't accessing um, treatment. And I think that, as you've noted, like there's been a number of other studies looking at menopause and um, black women. And one of the things that's come out is that black women are less likely to be on HIT. And just wondering if you wanted to um, reflect on that with us a bit more. Yeah, so there's a few studies that have looked at this. So I guess when we're thinking about ethnic disparities in menopause mm. care, first thing to say is that, so a, a lot of this data comes from the US. Mm. Um, so uh, African-American women are more likely to go through menopause at a younger age. They are more likely to have more severe symptoms mm -hmm. and they're more likely to have symptoms for longer. And... 
there's probably a lot of reasons underlying that. So that's partly genetic. So the age you go through menopause is very influenced by the age that your mother or your grandmother went through menopause. But if we think about how trauma is embodied through mm -hmm. generations, it's not a big stretch to sort of see why sort of traumatic events generations ago might continue to reverberate sort of in women's lives now. So what happened to their grandmothers, their great grandmothers mm -hmm. may be embodied by them. Um, also, as I've just said, with the prime data, women of colour are more likely to be socioeconomically deprived. And that's linked with increased menopausal symptoms and earlier menopause. They may be more likely as a result of all sorts of other stresses to be smoking, um, or to be using drugs or to be drinking. And all of these things are going to contribute to menopause. And they may be more likely to be living with other comorbidities, such as yeah. diabetes, such as HIV. So what we have here is a population who are at increased risk of more severe and protracted menopause. And now when we look at the data on how people access care, so there isn't much, to be honest. I mean, menopause yeah. hasn't, is, until relatively mm. recently, hasn't been a very fashionable sort of area. It's suddenly everyone's like on the menopause bandwagon. Mm. But... Um, <laughs> There's a couple of studies recently from the UK. So there's one study that's looked at um, prescription of HRT, hormone replacement therapy. So that's the hormones that you can give to women if they're going through menopause to alleviate symptoms. And I'm not here to say that you have to take hormones. Mm. Menopause is a natural thing for most women. But for many women, hormones can help. And uh, in this study, they looked at GP records across the UK. And what they found is that GPs with a higher sort of percentage of their GP of their population, patient population who are from racially minoritized communities, were spending four times less on HIT prescriptions than in um, GP practices where you have a higher prevalence of white British uh, patients, clearly showing an ethnic disparity. Secondly, there's another study, again, this has just come out about a month or so ago, which is an interview study with GPs that showed, so this is asking GPs what they thought, and the GPs were saying that they felt that there was um, a lack of awareness amongst uh, women from racially minoritized groups about menopause, perhaps um, different cultural expectations, and they, they felt that that made it difficult for women to access yeah. care. So I think you've got two things going on, uh, what's happening within the communities, but then what's happening structurally in terms of racism within the healthcare system. And, yeah. and how much do you think that racism is driving the inequities we're seeing in menopause care? I mean, I think you probably know what I'm going to say here, Susan, because I think racism, <laughs> structural racism underlies all of this. It's So whether that's down to how women embody the structural inequalities that they experience through an earlier menopause, through increased symptoms, through maybe medical mistrust, which is well-founded, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm whether it's not being able to prioritize your own health needs because you have so many other things that you have to deal with or whether it is that um you go to your gp or another health care provider and they don't they don't take you seriously they don't they don't listen to you they don't hear you uh, because you you can't advocate in the right language that makes doctors take note or you might not have all the statistics at your fingertips mm. um because there's lots of awareness around menopause at the moment. But what's really, really noticeable is that the majority of people who are championing menopause at the moment, with a few notable exceptions, are white. Mm -hmm. And that's the representation of what menopause experience is at the moment. Shima, com completely and related to that, um, you know, how many women I'm sure will be struggling with the language to even recognize they're going through menopause and, and, and then after that then going to advocate for themselves. Oh. So what advice would you give to a woman who um, perhaps knows or thinks that she's going through the menopause but is, isn't getting the care that she deserves or needs? Yeah I mean that's that's a really big one isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, we have to empower 
people with information. And what I'm really pleased to see is that the government's women's health strategy has made it really clear that a priority is to inform everyone about menopause so this is talking to boys and girls at school about menopause so it's on the agenda because actually when you have symptoms it's slightly too late you need to know before you get to that point what i would say to people is talk to your children teach them and not just your girls talk to your boys as well you need to be having that conversation as far as um if a woman is going through menopause at the moment or she's got symptoms and she's not sure do try and go and speak to your GP. Most GPs are sensitive. Speak to your friends. You'll be so surprised when you start talking to your friends how many of them share the same experience. That's all me and my friends talk about nowadays is (laughs) dating and boys to talking about HRT. (laughs) And there's some really great resources. Um, So Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecology, British Menopause Society, um, they all have really, really nice patient friendly, accessible leaflets, Um, lots of documentaries like the one by Davina McCall, which is really good. Um, Get yourself empowered with information. Fantastic. Absolutely agree with you. Thank you so much, Shima, for coming on. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, it's great to see you. See you soon. so important and as as a black menopausal woman I can certainly (laughs) relate to everything that she as a a black woman on high alert for the menopause (laughs) (laughs) absolutely and I think research is is so important and an area where we just don't have enough research is on sickle cell and I know that today is international sickle cell day what do you think people need to know about that Vanessa well I I think first of all and people need to know um, that sickle cell exists um, Mm -hmm. and just for a um, a brief overview so we've got our red blood cells that carry oxygen um, in our blood around the body and then within sickle cell um, the shape of the blood cells um, are um, sickle shaped and so um, they then stick together and it's harder for them to go through the bloodstream and so then it's harder for enough oxygen to go around the body that's a very quick overview Mm -hmm. but um, It is a really debilitating um, disease um, and um, one of the um, most difficult things is that the care that people living with sickle cell um, may experience within healthcare. And um, I'm really conscious because there are some amazing people that um, work within haematology services that really advocate for um, those living with sickle cell. But I think if you talk to those living with sickle cell, many would comment about that the care that they receive may, n- may not be consistent or what they need. Um, but I am happy to say, as ever, and um, we'll give a shout out to one of our previous guests, um, Professor Bola Olawabi, who... Um, um, who has been part of a national um, initiative um, to really think about how um, people living with um, sickle cell um, can benefit quicker access to NHS care. So, and I think hopefully in future episodes, we're going to be devoting some time to it, but uh, it is World Sickle um, Cell Day. And I think it's important people know about it and know though that um, there are initiatives within the NHS to improve things that are coming up. Fantastic. And that that's really, really great news because mm. so many people really struggle when they go to A&E. And mm-hmm. it's fantastic that hopefully people will be fast tracked to see a specialist exactly. now if they're in crisis. So fantastic. So shall we bring on our next guest, Dennis? Oh. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, Dennis, back from Sweden. Welcome back. The weather was great there. Yeah, like the same here in London now. So you're all showing off now. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful to have you on, um, Dennis. Uh, um, it's actually Refugee Week this week, uh, and I know that you do so much work with refugees. And I'm conscious that many refugees who actually arrive in the UK have experienced so much trauma on the journey. What are you hearing from the the people that you you're working with in terms of the impact that's having on their mental health? Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, so I think that's one of the things that's really not considered. Um, you know, the experiences of people prior, during, and after migration 
is not usually considered. I don't think that uh, the mental health services that are available uh, are currently uh, are taking care of the psychological distress and, and, and the mental health complications that people experience. Remember, it's always a very dangerous journey, first of all, through the military. But before that, there are a lot of people from sub-Saharan Africa, for example, who have spent months in Libya and in Tunisia, and they go through all sorts of, uh, you know, abuse and, 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 and torture. Uh, women experience sexual violence and uh, men are tortured. And so when they make that journey, come to Europe and uh, eventually find themselves in the UK and really, really there is no support available. And therefore, I think that's very important that we recognize that there is a lot of trauma. There is need from tra for trauma-informed counseling so that people uh, can be able to deal with a lot of issues that they have experienced. And I, I think that's lacking at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Gosh, thank you, Dennis. I think um, really sobering, but people need to hear it because I think um, people don't often know um, or even transport themselves into what it even could be like um, to be a migrant. Um, and I, I think feeding on from that, we regularly see such a, it's actually really toxic um, rhetoric mm -hmm. and hostility towards refugees in the media particularly. And you know, because of your work directly working um, with um, migrants, how do you think it's affecting the people that you're working with who are refugees? Uh, thank you, Vanessa. You know, we, we are really living in a in a in, at a, in a time in times of uh, I, I don't know what I can say. You know, people are quite uh, uh, not embarrassed about what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so you you see, I mean, the the the, the theme for Refugee uh, Week um, uh, is is this year is is compassion, and I think that's the last thing that we've seen over the, the, mm -hmm. the several years. Uh, I think the the worst culprit is the government. You know, the rhetoric, the inflammatory rhetoric uh, from the government is actually feeding onto the far right and and uh, you know agendas, and so you see a lot of hate for refugees and migrants from a certain region. And you know, people forget that behind each and everyone there's a story, there's a unique individual, they're not just migrants, there's a father, a sister, a brother, a mother. And 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 what we're seeing uh, as, as as Africans, as black people, or as people of color, it's really embarrassing that uh, despite the fact that we empathize with a lot of issues happening in Ukraine and the experiences of Ukrainian refugees, but we are living in times where we see one group of uh, migrants being desirable and uh, you know being welcome and encouraged and the other ones unwanted. And these are people who are, you know, you had like last week, 500 people died in, in, on a, in a boat. I mean, 500 people are, are feared to have died mm. in a boat in Greece. And so I, I just think that that compassion is gone. Um, there is a lot of negativity. And I think that negative, uh, that those inflammatory uh, um, 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 media reporting and words from the government, even the Home Secretary herself, is really not doing us any good, especially in terms of supporting people. You know, they are scared to come out of the shadows to access testing. And most of them reach healthcare services at a point of crisis. So I, I think that's something needs to be done. I think that we need to challenge uh, these double standards uh, Mm -hmm. this latent racism that we see when it comes to migrants and, if, uh, and asylum seekers. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I totally agree that it, it, it is blatant racism. And I mean, I, I'm really conscious as a, as a Black British woman that I'm likely to experience health inequities. But at the same time, I am aware that the fact that I am actually British and my economic privilege does actually shield me to an extent from you know some of the worst things that that people are experiencing in healthcare with the communities of people that you're that you're working with from migrant communities what kind of issues are you hearing from them about their experiences in the healthcare system um, so yeah, we as you know, we work uh, on in a number of areas, both long-term conditions and uh, in infectious diseases, primarily HIV. But we also work with people who are living with long-term conditions, kidney disease, for example. And and the experiences really vary. A lot of people feel that the system is not prepared for them. So a lot of individuals we speak with, they appreciate uh, the interactions with healthcare professionals because they feel cared for. But the systems are set up in such a way that it is difficult to navigate, especially if you are a refugee 
Nigerian as Haram Sikh and we don't have all the papers that are required. But even for, for people who are settled in this country or for black British people, you know, um, you, we still see that we fight every day for equality. We fight every day. We see a lot of disparities. So I was just speaking today to, uh, with a nurse, uh, a kidney nurse from King's College. And she's running peer support groups for people, uh, patients who, are, who have kidney disease. And she's saying herself, from a clinical perspective, she's saying she, you know, she's in a healthcare setting. And she was saying that the experience that she sees of the time it takes someone to get a kidney transplant, for example, which I know partly is because of donation, organ donation in black communities, but generally people's awareness around this is really, really low. So the reason why there's low donation of organs in this country is also because there isn't much awareness. But not only that, she was saying that in terms of the um, the, the, the uh, um, uh, dialysis, so she was saying that for people, for most people with she sees, most patients who have a white background, care has been tailored in such a way that they can actually have that dialysis at home whereas you find that black 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 patient black patients mostly have to go through the restrictive process of going for kidney uh, for dialysis three times a week so this is just one of those examples you know that demonstrates how unequal the system is and even how the risk of kidney health uh, disease is measured you know the kidney function you know that you know um uh, Vanessa might be able to explain that, but it's, it's been for, for black communities, it's been quite different from how they measure kidney function for black communities. So I think that uh, we, we, we need to be able to address this, uh, both in terms of how we call people to account, people who are in charge of planning health care services, because we still struggle, despite the fact that HIV has done very, very well. We still see highest number of undiagnosed HIV amongst black uh, people, we still see a lot of women unacceptably being diagnosed in emergency care settings when it's not supposed to be the case. So I think that, you know, the system health inequalities is a real thing. We have seen it during COVID, it is continuing. And I think that we really need to have a very honest and, and, and sober conversation about it. Oh, thank you so much, Dennis. I think you've just put that so eloquently. And um, it's, it, Gosh, the um, the dialysis example that you gave, and just just recognizing that it, it is about privilege. So, if you do have a home and you have you've got access to electricity, etc., you can have it at home. But if if that's not in your um, hands at the moment, then you you have to go to the hospital. So already there, you've got an, a disparity there. So um, no, thank you so much for articulating mm -hmm. that. And so really. You, you know, I, I can I can guess the answer to this question, but I'm just interested in your perspective because um, the the work that you do it's you, it really highlights that it's really important for um, ser services for migrant communities to be um, in the community, yeah. um, but also um, how important do you think that it's led by people from those communities, and also for it to be properly funded. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is an issue that we've always talked about, and I know you know it very well, that uh, there's always been textbook exercises, even for the mainstream charities working in different areas. The issue is that, you know, if there's a program for black communities, they get a black employee and then you know they ex expect everything to be fine and the, the, the principle around this is really co-production being able to sit down plan with people see what their needs are ensure that they're involved in the process whether they are volunteers or advocates for the service or they are hosting it you know themselves i think that's really how you get people involved and you just cannot sit around a table somewhere design services employ a black person and expect that those services are going to serve the needs of communities you know we are quite diverse we're a huge mm. huge diverse community and and unless you get people from different backgrounds and involve them, it's going to be very difficult. And, you know, we've seen um, the way funding is working. We know that even during COVID, it was widely acknowledged that funding for black for projects or for activities or initiatives in the community for black communities are not uh, sufficient. There's been disparity. You've seen the charities or white movement. Uh, you know, funders have been asking themselves questions whether there is any way that they can change. Uh, you know how they, they they award funding, and I think that you know we we need to be very honest. Even if you look at local authorities, you know we are currently challenging a lot and trying to work with local authorities around some of these issues but yeah um the, the disparities we see are likely because we are excluded from planning those activities we are not involved we are not made to lead those services and mostly it's very tokenistic just to see that they are doing something right but in the actual fact a lot of people are being left behind because of this 
Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I am so tired of the, the tokenism that we, we so regularly see in, in, in the charity sec sector. And thank you so much for, for speaking up about it. And yeah, I, yeah and, and I really understand the importance of co-production working with you on the Positive Champions project in terms of having videos about the importance of testing for HIV, but all of those videos, the content was coming from the people, from the communities who know best. So thank you so much, Dennis, for everything you're doing and for coming on the show today. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Susan. It's been a pleasure being with you here. Bye-bye. And, uh, Wonderful. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I, I could, we, we've actually run out of time. I could just keep going. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> so huge thank you to Shima and Dennis for coming on the show. Thank you for Disruptive Live for their technical wizardry and for the lottery for very kindly supporting this broadcast. Very true. And we are looking forward to our next episode, um, which will be on Monday, the 31st of July. So really looking forward to having more wonderful guests, to being with you, Susan. And you never know, it may be in the flesh. Fingers crossed. <laughs> oh, let's see. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Vanessa. And see you all on Monday, the 31st of July. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye.